Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, buenos dias, señoras y señores. My name is Sung Hun Kim. I'll be your host for this event. Uh, this is welcome to ICAO's 13th Air Navigation Conference. We're coming to you live uh, from Sky Talks. This is um, day four, session number 17. Uh, continuing from our session number 13, we're gonna talk about global air navigation plans uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Um, I want to remind you, uh, for those who are not able to attend or, or um, uh, these, these sessions, you can go on YouTube, uh, watch them, watch them uh, on rerun. Uh, please type IKO Sky Talks and you'll see the whole list of uh, sessions that we have for you. Uh, please refrain, because we're coming to you live, please refrain from uh, providing questions during the presentation and please wait till the end. Step up to the mic in the back and uh, go ahead and ask questions. Uh, our presenter today uh, is IKEO's answer to Zuleika uh, Rivera, uh, minus the 5.5 billion views on YouTube, of course, but hopefully she'll be able to bring up the numbers. Um, Olga de Frutos is a technical officer here at ICAO's Air Navigation Bureau. Please welcome Olga de Frutos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, so today, unfortunately, you have to be with me an hour. Um, I have to say that we usually do the presentation that I'm going to to hear today deliver it in one week, okay? So for you to understand the amount of content that the, con that the presentation has and the detail that I'm going to drive you through the slides. So it is true that this presentation, we use it with hands-on exercise, usually in the regional offices. So we usually have a little bit of theory, we apply, we apply the theory, we have more theory, we apply the theory and so on. Today will not be examples because we will not have time for examples, but I will try to do it as less painful for everybody as possible. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing, apologies in advance for the people that were here uh, yesterday during the presentation of the um, -link, interlink between the GAMP and the GASP, because I have to repeat some of the slides that I presented yesterday, but it's just in order to give everybody the background information that we all need to get into the presentation, okay? And if you have any questions, just please raise your hand and just interrupt me because it's a one hour presentation, so it's not like 20 minutes and then we can have the questions. You raise your hand and then we will stop, okay? So thank you very much for coming. And um, okay, I should go forward. So as I said yesterday, um, we have a new air in aviation, not only because the traffic will continue to double over, over 15 years, but also because we have new entrants that are coming to the system. And these new entrants will range from a small UAAs to super uh, and hypersonic uh, aircraft. So all of this, will, what we'll do is we will make employment to grow. And we think that the GDP could double by 2040. Now in this not easy scenario, what does the society and the aviation community in general expect from us? So what do we, do we expect for, uh, from us is that we are more quiet. People do not, do not like the noise that we make around the airports. I wouldn't like it either. So they expect that new advances in technology, they will improve the way we power aircraft so that we can reduce the, uh, the noise around the airports, basically. They expect a cleaner uh, system. So that means that we will have to use new concepts and procedures in order to make flight efficient, uh, the flight more efficient in order to reduce uh, fuel consumption and emissions. This is part of the commitment that the aviation community has with the, the protection of the environment. We must, we, safety is paramount. So with the evolution of the air navigation system, we will have to still increase uh, the safety of the system more resilience, all these new technologies, all these new space uses, all these new aircraft, what they are doing also is they are introducing into the system um, different or more threats, maybe different and more threats. And therefore we have to take a proactive approach in order to make the system more resilient. And for sure in a cost effective way. So how are we going to do this? We think we would do this through 
innovation, investing in innovation so that uh, we can um, get rid of everything that we have now in aviation, but in a safe way. Investments that we, we, we made in uh, equipment and in procedures that came from the last century. And we can modern, modernize together their navigation system to make it more profitable for everybody, not only for the more advanced or more mature countries, but also for the countries that, um, that are now um, developing. The reason is the countries that they are developing now, they are, haven't invested already lots of money in the infrastructure, and therefore for them is more uh, cost effective to modernize the system. So all of this in order to power the social well-being of the peoples of the world, okay? So this is what uh, the, the scenario we had, this is what the challenges we have, and this is what they expect from us. Now, what are we doing in order to achieve all of this? So this is the reason why, oops, sorry. This is the reason why we are proposing for the 2019 edition of the GAMP a multi-layer structure. Everybody complains that the GAMP is a complex plan. It is in fact, but their navigation system, it is a complex system. And the amount of information that we have in the global air navigation plan nowadays is not comparable with any other plan in the world. So that's why in order for us to, uh, to, to process the information and try to display it to everybody in a useful way, we have moved the plan from paper to a web-based platform. This will allow us to have consistency in the information, to have harmonization in the different layers of the, of the plan, and to present in a comprehensive way all the information that we have in the plan. We received many critics from the last edition of the GAMP, and one of them was that it was too high, uh, too high level for technical people, and it was too specific for, uh, for CEOs and these high level managers. So that's why we have decided to split the global, la the global layer on the GAMP on two, the strategic and the technical one. So the strategic will drive the evolution of the air navigation system, and it will contain the vision, the performance ambitions, and the conceptual roadmap that have been presented to the, to the 13th Air Navigation Conference on Monday, and they, they were very welcome by the floor. So I encourage you to go to the to www.4.ikeo.int slash GAM portal or just Google GAM portal, well, just Google GAM portal, and you will find there all uh, these vision, conceptual roadmap, and performance ambitions. Now, um, this is for the high level people. Then we have another layer for the technical people. I don't know if you or any of you are familiar, but we used to have this technical layer in a 400 pages document that nobody read, never ever. <laughs> I think not even the people that they wrote the document, they ever read the whole document. <laughs> Each of us wrote a part of the document and then we put it together. And that's why it was not very harmonized and it was not very well defined. So what we did is we got a group of people, some people were al already in the first team and some other people from the IKEO panel of experts and we form a group. This is a multidisciplinary working group because the technical level of the GAMP deals with all kinds of disciplines. So what this group did is, the first thing is that they decided to develop a template. Why we decided to develop a template? Well, the first reason is if you want to do something um, web-based, you need to be harmonized in terms of what you are going to put there and in terms of the granularity of the things that they are there. So we define a template with six parts. The first four parts, they were more concept driven and the two second parts, they were more performance driven. And then we review the 400 pages document, we update it and we put it into these templates. These templates serve the people of software development to create the digital ASVO framework. Apart from that, we also define a handbook on how, which was the process that we were going to use in order to update the ASVO framework. So what we did is uh, we had around, I would say, um, four teleconference by 23 threads that we have in the ASVOs during three months or something like that. So we were all tired of each other by the end of the three months, of course. 
So, uh, coming back to the global technical level, I have been talking here about the ASBUS and the 400 document. In the previous edition of the camp, we did not have the basic building block. And everybody's saying, oh my God, I was inventing something else. Now we don't have block zero. Now we have the basic building block. What is the basic building block? The basic building block is nothing new. It's just a way that we have draw in a whiteboard the shells that we have in the ICAO annexes and procedures for air navigation services. So these are the mandatory things, the services that need to be provided according to ICAO standards uh, and uh, procedures that are mandatory in ICAO provisions. In, um, and we have drawn it in a schema. Why we have done this? We have done this because the ASBUS uh, were very popular Everybody was talking about the ASBUS, and even people that did not have implemented these minimum services, they were jumping directly into the ASBUS framework. So if you have the wrong way, a wrong way with the pavement that it has a hole, you have to fix that before implementing in a ASBUS. This is the message that we are trying to transmit with the basic building blocks. In this same level, we have the performance-based decision-making method. That is what we are going in what we are going to focus today. So I will talk about it later on. Then we have the regional level. The regional level it has the research and development programs that we have around the world today. So we have CARATS, we have CAMS, we have One Sky, we have Nexian, we have Cesar and some other uh, states that they don't, they have ATM research and development uh, programs, we have put them together in order to help us to define the global strategic level and where are they investing and where do we want to go and where they will have to invest on in order to define the specific operational improvements in order to arrive there that we have put in the ASBUS. And we have the ICAO regional plans. So the ICAO regional plans, uh, they used to have two volumes, the basic and the facet. Now we have three volumes. So the difference between the basic and the, and the facet was that the basic, were, they were the stable elements. Usually they are um, things that do not change very often, like FIR boundaries. And then we have the services and facilities in the second volume because there are things that are basically, they change more often, like the ATS routes or things like that. So the reason of why these, they were in two volumes is that the process of amendment of these volumes, it is different. Volume one, it depends on the approval of, of the approval of the council. Well, because it's more political, it's things that involve um, the political decisions. While the volume two is something that is more technical. So the process to amend volume two is based on regional agreement. And then we have volume three. That is the new volume that was included in 2014 by the council in order to align the regional air navigation plans with the global air navigation plan. And it deals with the planning and implementation of the different um, ASBU elements or operational improvements in the ASBU framework that um, need to be implemented at a regional level. Then we have the national, uh, the national level. Well, sorry, before going to the national level, I have to say that because of the structure of the regional air navigation plans, volume one and volume two, they are now aligned with this basic building block framework that we are talking about. So now global and regional plans, they are completely aligned from a technical perspective. Then we have the national level. So the national level is not responsibility of ICAO is responsibility of the states. So we are encouraging the states to develop national air navigation plans in order to plan the implementation of, of the modernization of the air navigation system through the basic, basic building blocks and the ASBUS in order to have all a harmonized, uh, a harmonized or seamless system. So um, now I will pass over all these slides because basically repeats what I'm saying now, and I will go directly to this one. So what is the main goal of the GAMP, of the 2019 edition of the GAMP? As I say, it is two goals. One, to drive the evolution of the air navigation system, 
basically by promoting investment in aviation in order to make more cost effective the achievement of the expectations of the society and the aviation community in general and accommodate the new expert uses and the new challenges that we have in the system and uh, guide these research and development pro programs, the investment on these research and development programs in the same direction and support implementation. Now, how is this supporting implementation done? Through the global technical level. As we said, we have the pillars of their navigation system that are the basic building block, the checklist that everybody should check. We have, uh, we have the ASVU framework, which will facilitate a transformational change. And we have the performance-based decision-making method or performance uh, management process. So this method, what will, that we are going to talk now about it, is the method that will help us to modernize the, uh, the, um, their navigation system in, uh, in an optimum way from the perspective of the allocation of resources. Any questions still here? No? Yeah? I think you have to go to the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry. Very simple question okay. about the uh, uh, previous slide. Okay, previous slide, yep. It's a volume three. Yep. What is it about? Yes, so volume three nowadays, what it does is it tracks the implementation and it plans the implementation of a specific operational improvements that are outlined in the ASVU framework. That so at a regional level, through the planning and implementation regional groups, the PIRCs, they get together and they decide that from a regional perspective, they need to implement certain modules at a regional level in order to improve the performance of their navigation system. So they decide on the implementation of these modules and then they put it in this volume three. And then this volume three basically is like a, a report on how the regions are implementing the aviation system block upgrades. So for the moment being, it's a, it's a volume that is focused on, uh, on implementation, on monitoring implementation. However, we want to modify it to drive it through a performance-based approach uh, method. And this is one of the recommendations that we have in, in agenda item 4.3 of the conference is that this volume three of the regional air navigation plans to be driven by performance and not by implementation. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. So with the performance based decision making method, ICAO is venting another thing. No, we are not. Why? This method is described in document 9883 of ICAO, the Manual on Global Performance of their Navigation System. However, we understand that it's a document that is not easy to understand once you read it the first time. That's what, in order to facilitate the, impl the implementation of the application of this method, what we have done is we, we have simplified it and we have divided in six steps that should be followed. Before getting into the, into the steps, I would like to highlight the principles of this method. So the principles of this method is that a strong, is a strong it has a strong focus on desired and required results, its reliance on, on facts and data for decision making, and is uh, based on collaboration among all the stakeholders in and justi justified decision making based on so on the data and uh, and facts that we have in the second principle okay so this is the theme of the method fall in love with the problem and not with the solution it looks like a very weird sentence once you read it the first time but if you think about it you will see that you're right. Why? Because sometimes when we focus on the solution instead of focusing on the problem, what we can do is that we do not choose the right solution for the problem that we have, or what is even worse, we choose a solution for a problem that we did not have before. So that's why all the method is based on basically this, uh, this uh, theme that is fall in love with the problem and not with the solution, which is the problem that we have. The six step method, 
are these six that you have here, uh, outlined here. So where step one is the scope, context, general ambitions and expectations. Step two is this what analysis and set objective. Step three is set of targets, calculation of needs. Step four, optimum solution identification. Step five, the deployment. And step six, the result assessment. So as you can see, this is not a one method that is applicable one time and I forget about it. No, this is a continuous process that has to be applied in a continuous basis. This process is not only applicable at a local level, but it should be applied at a regional and a global level. And we are going to see now how, what do we expect from you, the states so or the aviation community, to use this method. So the step one, the scope, the context, and the performance ambition. The first thing when we try to develop a national air navigation plan that would be the deliverable of applying this method is to define the scope. Which is the scope? Which is the context and which are the ambitions that we expect to achieve within that, uh, within that scope? Uh, any, project manage, any project management project, the first step is to define um, which is inside the project and which is outside of the project. So this is what we are trying to do in this first step, and we are asking the states to analyze. So for instance, Spain might have um, 54 uh, international aerodromes, but because, uh, I don't know, like uh, three of them, they do not have almost traffic, I decide to not put them in my national air navigation plan. This is a decision that needs to be made. You know? So all of this is what we expect you to do in this plan, in this step, sorry. So first, we start to look at the context and what we are talking about the context, apart from the economy of the, of the country, apart, apart of uh, which is the geography of the country and things like that, we ask you to please pay attention to which is the context in terms of planning of their, on, of their navigation system. And in terms of this planning, we have two basic plans that you should look at when developing your national air navigation plan. One is the global air navigation plan that we have talked about, and two is the regional air navigation plan. So in the, national, in the global plan, as we said, we have all these performance ambitions that they are defined in 11 key performance areas. Um, I will, well, key performance areas, and when I talk about key performance areas, I'm talking about capacity, efficiency, predictability, flexibility, things like that, okay? Performance, we are not talking about implementation. And, um, and then we have performance objectives. So what are the performance objectives? The performance objectives is something new that we have included in this version of the camp. And they are like qualitative indicators. As you know, as you know in the previous edition of the camp, we have a list of key performance indicators. So everybody was uh, very happy with these indicators. But in order to measure these indicators, you need to make investment and you need to collect data and you need to calculate data. So it's a quantitative approach. If you cannot follow this quantitative approach, we are proposing you to follow a qualitative one. That's why in this version of the plan, we have included a catalog of performance objectives that they are linked to each of the improvements that we outlined in the, in the ASBUS. So when we developed this template that I was talking to you about a few minutes ago, the last two parts of these templates are the ones that focus on which are the performance benefits, the performance objectives that each of the ASBU uh, improvements contributes to. And then we have the regional air navigation plans. So the re in the regional air navigation plans, as I was just answering the question of the gentleman in the first row, uh, what we expect is that this volume three will not only talk about implementation, targets in terms of implementation, but it will shift to performance. And what does it mean? It means that it will have specific performance objectives based on regional agreements and based on the need of each region. So as you can see, the performance ambitions are very generic. Why? Because the camp is not mandatory. So what we are trying to give is directions on how to drive the evolution of the system to achieve those performance ambitions. However, we expect that at a regional level, through the planning and implementation and regional group, each region agrees on which are the performance objectives that it should follow. Like which is the level of performance that from a regional perspective you want to deliver from the navigation system. So this is part of the context of the air navigation planning. And then we have this, the scope. 
So everything that is not in the scope, it is in the context. And from a scope perspective, what we want is you to define a national air navigation plan. As I said, you have to say, what do you want to put in your national air navigation plan? That is the first thing. Once you have done that, in this national navigation plan, we would like you to have performance targets. We will say how to say how to set that, and we will make clear assumptions of what is surrounding this. Like for instance, would you have military aviation in your national air navigation plan or no? Would you consider a general aviation in your plan or no? For how long is your plan? Is your plan 25 years, five years, 10 years? How long is your plan? How often are you going to update your plan? All these things. And we are asking you as part part of uh, also this, uh, this conference that it, we will deal with it or discuss it in agenda item 4.1 to develop national development plans that are, and that these national, national air navigation plans are aligned with the national development plan because this will help you to get funding and financing on investments that you will need to, to do in your system. Step two. So what is the step two? The step two is um, we cannot plan the implementation of the modernization of the, any air navigation system if we do not know our system. So in order to know our system, we need to, uh, to do data collection, processing, and analysis. And how do we do that? So in order to do that, ICAO is providing us with a list of key performance indicators to measure the performance of our air navigation system. This list of key performance indicators, before it was 16, now it's 19, is available also in the GAN portal. When you go to the GAN portal and you go to the ASU framework, you will have this list of indicators. Now, these indicators, they are not defined only like a number of operations per hour. No, they are defined in uh, very well. So you will see there that it says which is the which, which is the intent of the indicator, what does it expect to to measure, um, which is the data that you need to collect in order to calculate that indicator, how to calculate that indicator, and you will have also examples of analysis that have been done around the world. So you have Brazil, you have Canso, you have the US, uh, you have Eurocontrol. You will see their catalogs of examples on the reports on, on, on measuring these key performance indicators. Now, when we measure all these uh, key performance indicators, we measure for now, how the system is performing now. But it's also important that, that we look into the future. I'm saying, how is it my traffic going to evolve? Why is this important? Because it's better to plan the, the, implement, the modernization of the air navigation system in advance, not late. So that's why, apart from looking into the present, you have to look into the future. And it's important to calculate which would be your traffic forecast. Apart from all of this, we recommend you to do a SWOT analysis. So a SWOT analysis is to identify the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats that your system has. So some of them will be under your control, and some of them they will not. And all of this will help us to set the performance objectives. So this is what analysis we uh, we recommend you to do it at the two levels, not only at a national level, like from, from a perspective of a country, but also at a local level. Each airport, each FIR, each TMA, which is the weakness, the opportunities, the strengths that it has. We know that the level of detail where you can do this analysis at a local, at a national level is different. but. Both of them would be useful for different things. At the national level, it would be useful to set performance objectives that are um, an, an a national performance framework that are kind of more high level. While at a local level, you would be able to identify which is the solutions of the ASVUS that can help you to improve the performance in that specific operational environment. So step three, the step three is the targets and the needs. So once we have, uh, we have identified the scope, the context, the performance ambitions, we have done this, the scope analysis, and we have set performance objectives, all of this was qualitative. We did a qualitative analysis in order to understand how our system works. Now we have to deal with the calculation of targets and needs. So here we are getting into uh, a more quantitative approach. We are talking about numbers. So how to do this, you know? Like the collection of data and the calculation of key performance uh, indicators is not free. 
I'm sorry, but it's not free. It costs lots of money to collect all this data, and it costs lots of money to calculate all this data. So you, we recommend that you focus in the areas that you need to improve. So based on your SWOT analysis, based on the data that you know, in your ex expertise, in, in, in your experts in your, in your country, which are the focus areas that you should focus on in order to set performance objectives? You should do prior prioritization. I never know how to say this word, apologies. Of all these, uh, of all these, um, of all these areas. Now, how are how this? Thank you. How these objectives have to be? So these objectives have to be smart. So what is smart? Smart means specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bounded. And how are we going to achieve this? So we are going to achieve this very easy. The first two, specific and measurable, ICAO is trying to facilitate our work, and by using these key performance indicators that we have defined in the camp portal we will achieve the part of the specific and measurable part of a smart objectives so i recommend that you could go there now these ones have also to be achievable relevant and unbounded so in order to achieve all of this this is on you what do you have to do what does achievable mean achievable means that we cannot say that, I don't know, I'm going to run the marathon in, le in an hour and a half because nobody does that. So that is not, I, I am setting a target that I already know that I will not achieve and therefore I will not try to improve my performance in order to achieve something that I know that is unachievable. So that's why it has to be achievable. It has to also be relevant because I can say, yes, I'm going to run a marathon in uh, 10 hours. Well, Anybody can do that, so I would be very relaxed, say I don't have to do anything, no. So it has to be challenging. And it has to be time bounded, why? Because to sit down there and, and just wait for the thing to happen, it will not happen. So I need to, 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 to set the right value on the indicator and in the right time in order to have a smart objective. So once we have set the Oh, sorry, it went up. up. <laughs> so the performance needs would be the performance tar targets that we put, that is the value to these, uh, to these uh, key performance indicators, minus the baseline, which is what we are doing now. This is the performance that I need to improve in my air navigation system. So I'm happy that my friend Matthew is here. Hello, Matthew, good morning. So I had the chance to to, to to visit Africa quite a few times already uh, when this is just a break in the middle of the six steps for us to go back to, to the theory. But I want to tell you a story. So I went to Africa a few times and I was very lucky being uh, with them because I really like the people in Africa and I have, uh, I enjoy very much every time I go there. But during all these times that I went to Africa, this allowed me to learn about Africa. And I did not know that, in fact, Africa, the extension of Africa is 20% of the extension of the world. And in Africa, the big cities, the cities that are above like 300,000 people or something like that, they are uh, separated hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. like. The environment there is desert, is challenging to have road infrastructure. So although they, although they are, I think, in the third position of the world in terms of separation of big cities, their infrastructure is the less dense of the whole world. What does this mean? This means that it's perfect for aviation and that aviation is essential in Africa. Um, apart from that, we know that some states in Africa, they do not have uh, implemented the five freedoms of the air yet. So that's why when you go to Africa, sometimes you have to travel like you're in Africa, then you go back to Europe and then you come back to Africa and everybody say, why I'm doing that? I don't know why airlines, they do not fly from one state to the other one. Well, it's not that simple. But the good news is that uh, I think around 15 countries in Africa, they, have, uh, they are going to, um, to adhere to the Yoshimuro decision and they will open the skies. So there will be a huge increase in traffic in Africa, mainly um, low-cost companies. 
And uh, this, uh, as I say, this is projected in the, in the statistics. I'm not inventing anything. So if you look at the statistics of the traffic, for instance, of Boeing statistics, you will see that in average, all the segments in Africa are expected to grow around an average of, I would say, like 6.3% or something like that. So this is well above the average of the world. Last year, I had the chance to, it was last year, Matthew? I think so, yeah. Last year, I had uh, the chance to go to Nigeria. And I did was even more interesting because I learned lots of things from Nigeria. So Ni Nigeria is the first economy in Africa. Their main uh, uh, economic activity is agriculture, okay? But they are not only the first uh, country in agriculture in Africa. In fact, they are the sixth in the whole world. So they are, they are uh, dealing with lots of challenges in Africa. And uh, one of these challenges is the drones. Why? The, the principal activity, or one of the activities why drones are being used nowadays is agriculture. And being agriculture, the principal activity of Nigeria, guess what? They will have billions of drones flying soon in Africa. So this is one of the things that uh, I learned when I was in Africa and in Nigeria. I know that they had a re recession at the beginning of 2016, but now they are out. And the GDP, I think it will grow around 3.6% per year or something like that. So as you said, like everything looks good there and they have lots of work to be done. So I was in this meeting with uh, many people. They have many agencies there, like each of them takes care of one thing, meteorology, the service provider, the CA. And I was with all the, these DGs. And before going to Nigeria, I asked Matthew, my friend Matthew, Matthew, excuse me, like, can you send me some data about, about Nigeria, about how their navigation system in Nigeria is performing? And they say, yes, Olga. And they say, here you go. And they send me all this data. And I say, very interesting, you know? So I, 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 uh, I show this data to all these people, all these CEOs and all these directors, and I say, so this is Nigeria. They have an FIR, Kano, that is divided into sectors, Kano and Lagos, they have several TMAs, and these are the main, the main airports that they have with the number of passengers, the cargo, and the operations. And I say, and I ask them very simple questions. So based on this data, how is the system performing? Do we have any delay? Are we punctual? Are we accommodating our demand? Well, there was the same silence as here in the room, you know. And they and all say, uh, so, oh my God, we are in trouble. And I say, yes, you are. But, uh, but no, but then the good news is that when, when Matthew sent me all this data and I was kind of a little bit shocked and I said, okay, Matthew, but I cannot really know how are you doing with this data. I sent him back some of the indicators that I consider more important in, in, and they, they were easier to measure in Africa. You remember, Matthew? And then I say, Matthew, I think during these two weeks that we have for the meeting, you will have to work. So I need you to calculate me these indicators using the data and send them to me. So we put them in this table, the summary. These are the airports in, in Nigeria. These are the four main airports in Nigeria, in Nigeria. And these are some of the indicators that you can see in the first column, okay, key, key performance indicator one, two, nine, uh, 10, that, we, uh, that they calculated for me. So then I ask these CEOs and these directors, so how are you doing? I ask them the same questions that I asked them before. And they say, ah, well, sometimes good and sometimes bad. And I say, okay, and why is that? And they say, well, you know, the capacity, we are using it quite well. However, our punctuality in Abuja is quite low. Our departure punctuality, we are good in Lagos. And then they start thinking why that could be. So apparently, I don't know, but apparently Abuja has connection with another airport. And because of this airport was delayed, then the departure delay was, was translated into the airport in Abuja. 
So all, all of these things, the thing is that with this data, they were able to understand how well they were doing at an airport level in Nigeria. So they, they start saying, oh, we need to improve this, oh, we need to improve that, we need to do this, we need to do that. This was important. Why? Because when you get to your CEOs and you ask them all these questions and can with this data I say, I need to do this for this, I need to do this for that, I need to do this for that, they will actually give you the money because they know what they are investing on. So all of this is not only for us to plan efficiently and so on. We need to get the investment. We need to optimize the, the, the allocation of resources. And that's why a quantitative approach, even though it's, uh, it's costly, is important. So going back to our method, we have done step one, two, and three, and we have now quantitative numbers. We have our targets. Now we have to identify the optimum solution. And how do we do this? So in order to identify our let me, oops, sorry. In order to identify our optimal solution, we have to look back. We have to look back to the SWOT analysis that we have done. We have to look back to which are our performance objectives, our performance uh, uh, indicators, our targets. Because in this step, step four, is where all the previous analysis get together in order to do the decision of where we need to put the money. This is the identification of the optimal solution. So based on the dominant factors in the main constraints, usually if you have an issue in the wrong way occupancy time, you should not invest in, the, in reducing the minimum separation to the wrong way. Why? Because if, even if you invest on that, if your constraint is in the occupancy time of the wrong way, you will not increase your capacity. So all of this is important. Now, how to know which are the options that we have available in order to invest in the, in the, in the perfect solution. So in order to, to have a list of options, we need, I will ask you to please make a list of options that considers all these things. It's part of a high level strategy, uh, it's part of an operational concept so that you are not deploying or investment in, uh, in um, different kind of systems that do the same function. Uh, you need to identify the enablers that you need to implement in order to have this operational improvement. And you need to make sure that they are all available, uh, which is your baseline, how much have you invested. You need to do a safety assessment and all these things. So can somebody of you make me a list of all the possible solutions that fulfill these requirements? I can, because it's already done. This is what the ASVU framework is. The ASVU framework is just a list of solutions, of best practices that has been implemented around the world, that they fulfill all these requirements, and then they will help us to improve the performance of their navigation system. It's a menu. Somebody comes to you and says, you have to look for a solution for a problem. Check if it's in this list. And if it's not, and you invent another solution, please send it to us, and we will put it there uh, happily. So you, you would be able to get into the ASVU framework, in fact, to a digital format of the ASVU framework through the CAM portal. And the good part is that if you get into the global technical level and the ASVU, digital ASVU framework, you will be able to filter. So if you are looking at the airports, you will be able to only focus in the area of airports. If you, are, uh, if you want to look in terms of capacity, you can only look to the, to the, to the capacity part of um, solutions that improve capacity and so on and so forth. So this is just a menu that you can go there and check. In this menu, you will also you will have which is the main purpose of the solution, which is the description. You will have uh, which is the, um, the issue that is trying to solve. You will have which is the dependencies that it has with other elements. And you will have a list of enablers. The enablers are everything that you need to have in place in order to have this operational improvement. So the enablers are important, why? Because they need to be available, and usually it's not only one person that needs to implement all the enablers, but these enablers have to be implemented by different people, by the air navigation service provider, by the CAA, by, uh, by, um, by the, um, the space users. Uh, sometimes search and rescue centers. So you have all identified all these stakeholders that need to involve in the deployment or the implementation of each of these solutions. 
as part of the identification of the optimal solution, apart from the information that we need to make available and, the, and look at the objectives and the SWOT analysis that we have done and look at the solutions of the ASBUS, we need to do basically three things, maybe four. Four things. So the first one is a safety assessment of all the potential solutions that we think they will help us. Because if it's not safe, we don't care about it. We need to do a human factors assessment to see the things that we need to implement in order to mitigate uh, the possible uh, human factors con considerations or, or implications that this change in their navigation system has. We need to perform an environmental impact assessment and we need to do a cost uh, benefit analysis in order to, to see which is the optimal solution from all of them. So in order to do a safety assessment, we have safety assessment guidance in ICAO. Uh, nowadays, we have it in another place, in another portal in the website. However, we expect to have it together or interlink uh, by the end of next year with all these ASBUS. So that whenever you get into the ASBUS, you, you will have a link to go to all these guidance that is relevant for this ASBU implementation, including some safety assessments that have been done around the world, examples on how to do this. This is the link for sure that the GAMP has with the GASP, as I said yesterday, so I will not go again through this uh, slide, but I just put it there to remind you that this is where the GAMP and the GASP get together. You need to do an Im environmental impact assessment, so you have environmental impact assessment guidance in ICAO. So I have, uh, I have just outlined now there, they have also action plans and some other tools like IFSET and so on that will help you to assess which is the environmental impact assessment that you have from the, from the implementation of the operational improvement. And you have to do a, K a CBA. You can do a CBA like the ones that I do here, for instance. No, that's, that's not true. You cannot do this kind of cost-benefit analysis because it's just a very qualitative high-level uh, cost-benefit analysis. But this is kind of the exercise that we make when we try to do training in the regional office. So we do this CBA assessment by guessing which of these solutions is which ball. So I just put it here to tell you that this is good for an example, but it's not good enough to, in, to do it in, in the real world. However, ICAO has cost-benefit analysis guidance and uh, the Air Transport Bureau has just developed a tool that would be available in, by the end of the year and will help you to perform this cost-benefit analysis of these operational improvements in the ASPO framework. So once we have done all of this and we have decided on which are the solution that will solve our problem based on the theme that we have in this method, or we have defined on the roadmap of optimal solutions that we need to implement, what we do is we deploy the solution. And what we have to do when we deploy the solution is keep track of how the deployment is being. I'm investing some money. Is really this money being invested in what I want? Is there a delay on the project? Is not a delay on the project? Is, that, is, the, is there an issue with the project? This is project management of a, a normal project deployment of an operational improvement. So I need to take track of how the project of implementation is actually being deployed in order to assess the benefits. That is our last improvement, our last step, sorry. That is the assessment of results. So once we have deployed all these solutions, we need to check that we really have done it right. And in order to do that, we have to go again, review which has been the actual, the, the improve in the performance by measuring again the performance indicators, which is kind of a step one and two of this method. And I start with a step three again by setting targets and so on. This we do it through a performance and monitoring uh, uh, report that should include all these things, data collection, publication, analysis, and so on. So this method is also very good in order to get two things, transparency and accountability from all the people that are involved in all this process. As I said, the bad news is that this is not a process that is just applied one day and it, we do not expect only to apply it at a global level, but it has to be applied at each local level and national and regional and global level with different levels of detail for sure. 
Now, what is IKEO doing in order to, to facilitate the implementation of this method? So, as I said, we have been doing seminars, uh, regional seminars. Sometimes we also go to states, like when we went to Nigeria, in order to help the states uh, to, to apply this performance uh, management process and develop uh, that it would be translated or it would be reflected in the National Navigation Plan. And we are develop, developing an automation tool. So we call it AN SPA. It is not a SPA. But what we are trying to do with AN SPA is facilitate the life of the states and all stakeholders. So it's not available nowadays. I cannot show you here today because I need to stay here and uh, I cannot manage the computer, but I brought my computer. So if any of you want to, to, to see what we have for the moment being, I'm happy to show, uh, to show it to you. It should be available by next year. I would say like the beginning of next year, but what this tool does is it, um, it asks you questions. It goes through this six step by asking you questions. What do you want to analyze? An airport and TMA and an IFRR. Uh, which, uh, which is the delay in your airport? Is your airport embedded in cities? Is not embedded in cities? How many languages does it have? Are they parallel? Are they not parallel? So by asking all these questions, what it is do is guide you through these uh, one and two steps of this, of this performance-based decision-making ma method. It helps you to set objectives and to identify which is the key performance indicators that are associated with that uh, objectives for you to set your own targets and once you have set your own targets it, it gives you the guidance that we were talking about on how to do to uh, which are the the set of operational improvements in the ASVU framework that contribute to those targets and uh, guidance in terms of safety human uh, environment and cost-benefit analysis so that you can have everything in this integrated tool and uh, it will facilitate then the identification of the optimal solution. So I don't have anything else to do. I'm sorry, I hope I don't, didn't make this very painful. I know that it was too much information for an hour of, uh, of presentation. And as I say, we usually what we do is we do it in, uh, with practical exercise, which makes it much more uh, nice for everybody, not only for you. Um, but uh, if you have uh, any questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Thank you. Well, if not, I wish you a very good day of conference. Ah, oh, yeah, I hope you have one. Yes, apparently, yes, somewhere. It's a big on the, on the YouTube video, you have the no, but it's not all the time the slides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yes, in the videos, you're welcome. So um, if there are no more questions, then I wish you a very nice day of our conference. It's Friday, we are over the, f the first week, so uh, we should be <laughs> done soon. <laughs> thank you very much for coming and thank you for your attention. Have a nice day. <laughs>